So we are going to talk seriously about what we started with an overview last week about the regression analysis. So has any one of you sort of never did any regression analysis? Do you more or less all have been through it somehow or have seen it and so on? So then we can uh, justify uh, moving as fast as I'm going to actually. So um, yeah, well it's okay. It's good to review maybe some years since you saw this thing and uh, let's just take it from the bottom. So we're going to start with uh, what we call the two variable linear model. And you know, regression analysis, it's all about uh, r working with relations between random variables. And you will probably be surprised how much we can do by utilizing such relations later on in the course. So there is a billion of different applications of regression analysis. Just to start with, um, this one variable could be the demand for a product. And this could be the price. And then you know the demand will depend on the price. But we don't know exactly how that happens. And You are transporting uh, containers on truck. How is the exact transport cost of that container depending on the weight of the container, for instance? So those are just two examples, but um, you will, I mean, you can think of millions. So what we need to do is we need to think about models, as I talked briefly about last week. Um, and a model is just some reasonable approximation of reality. Um, so regarding when we talk about the relationship between two variables, it's very natural to think about describing some kind of a functional form. Or we can think of a kind of a curve. So when it's price. I know economists like to have the price on that axis and the demand on that axis often. Uh, for me, being a mathematician, it's difficult. <laughs> so it's going to be exactly the same, but I have, I mean, I, I like to think of the demand as a function of the price. So if you increase the price of your airline tickets, for instance, the net number of tickets you can sell will go down. So the typical model here is something like this, which is actually a nonlinear relationship. But if you call this y and you call this x, then this function is some, I mean, then you say that y is some function of x. And in the other example, maybe it's we would uh, clearly expect that the transportation cost would be increasing with higher weight on the container. So you would expect some weight and cost here. Mm. Maybe something like this. I don't know exactly that it needs to be linear, but let's uh, just assume it. And these are the sort of basic economics textbook relationship between price and demand, for instance. But we know in reality there will there will uh, almost always be additional randomness. So if I put my price here, 
I can have this model as a sort of guideline, but I know that supposing this is the monthly demand or something, I realize that the actual sold quantity could be here, it could be here, 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 uh, somewhere around this curve. right? So this model that I talk about uh, mainly describes a statistical behavior. right? So in, in expectation, if I increase the price, my demand will go down. But for a particular uh, period, it could be higher or lower than this expected value. And if you plot a number of weeks or periods, you typically get data that sort of fluctuates somewhat around this curve. And similarly here. If I take a particular weight here, I can estimate the cost like with this curve. But maybe the true cost could be a bit lower or a bit higher. So this is very essentially what we are going to do. We're going to have a model that consists of a functional form and a random component. So we are going to look once again at this data that I've shown you some time before, just because it's very transparent. So we have a transportation company. And they have, maybe in a city, they have a number of trips they need to perform. And each trip is between two customers, probably sometimes between a depot and a customer. But they can split their sort of uh, part of their planning situation into, into trips like this. And each trip has a distance. And it has a duration. So Suppose at the beginning of the day they have today's uh, uh, orders, then they know exactly the distances, supposing the drivers drive where they're supposed to drive and so on. So they have a set of distances, but they don't know the durations. But they do know that the durations will be functions in a way of the distance for each trip. So there will be some strong, fairly strong dependency here. And yeah, so if, if we assume we have some period of the day where the traffic is relatively constant, then mainly the distance will be uh, affecting the, the duration. So of course, this picture could change radically in some cities from, say, this period from 10 morning till 2 afternoon, and then 3 and 4 afternoon, you could have rush hour traffic, then the, the, the functional dependency would be totally different. So what I'm saying is distance and duration. It could be in one period of the day, this relationship could look like this, so from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So, but in rush hour traffic, it could look like that. So we have to be a little bit careful here that we sort of try to estimate or to, to have a model that is working under homogeneous traffic conditions. So that's why I say, but we will learn in a couple of weeks how could we model in the same model uh, the same relationship, but also taking into account uh, in different levels of traffic intensity. But that will re require us to have a multiple regression model with several variables. So it's not for today. 
Um, yeah. So these data then, supposing they have observed for some days or some periods, um, here's one trip of seven kilometers and it took so and so long. Here's another for five kilometers and it took so and so long. Then you have a data set like this. And I think there are 200 observations here just for, for this set. And of course, we saw in our very first or second lecture, this is about descriptive statistics. How do we first try to uh, assess some kind of dependency? Well, we talk about correlation and we talk about scatter plot. So we plot the x variable against the y variable, and you get this picture <coughs> showing a very clear dependency. And it's going in the right direction. We ex expect higher distance to lead to higher duration, obviously. So we can just uh, since we I mean if you look at the picture here it really looks like quite close to something linear in the bottom there, and then there is some random deviation on top of that. So it makes a lot of sense to talk about the correlation here, which is about 0 0.95, which means a strong linear dependency. And The model we would probably choose for this one is, as I say, the functional relation is a linear function of x. So we say we model the duration as a linear function of distance, and then something to take care of the randomness here. And it's done like this. Well, it's there. y is a linear function plus uh, of x. And then we know for a given value of x, it's this, but there is some deviation, some noise, randomness. The kid has a lot of names. But we're going to write it like this. So we call this an E. Um, and this a and b, they are constants. So this defines, if you think of x and y as variables on the scales, it's a linear function plus randomness. Yeah. So this is the basic linear regression model, actually. So for now, we just say that this guy here, it's a random variable. And we are saying that the expected value of this is 0, which means on average, the linear model is correct. But for individual observations, we go above and below sometimes. But on average, it's going to be the linear function. So the interpretation of this model for the dependency between these two variables is as outlined here. Um, if you take a trip of some length x, then 
this will be the expected or the mean value. Now, this is probably hard to read on the video, but it says y mean. Um, and this is, of course, given by this curve, which is a plus bx. And then if I take now just one single trip, it is modeled as a random variable with which has the value y mean plus some error. So the value is here, but I have this random factor that will take me somewhere up or down relative to this. Mm -hmm. single trip. So it, it's, of course, important to note the difference between the mean behavior and the behavior for a single trip. So in the mean behavior, in the average behavior, you have no randomness. If I put x here, I can tell you, theoretically at least, exactly what is the average. But if you tell me, OK, this is one 10 kilometer trip, what's going to be the duration of it? Well, I can tell you it's going to be on average this, but I have to say plus minus in an interval plus minus something like this with 95% certainty or something. So I have to address the randomness in single trips. So we are doing this in a few steps, going a little bit back and forth. But um, in the end, I hope everything will be fairly clear. Um, so the, the primary tasks, if we can talk about that, task. Okay, is uh, basically we have this model, we believe in the linear model, and we want to find what we call the best estimates. For the parameters, those A and B. Um, and they will, of course, be based on the data set that I showed you with a scatter plot looking like this. And then you find the line that is best fit to this. That, that will be what we call the best estimates for the parameters. And we will show you, I will tell you later why or what we mean by best and so on here. But let's just accept for now that if you put this data into SPSS, it's going to tell you that the best estimates are 1.16 for the constant, and it's 2.23 for the slope here. So the, the B number is the slope. Slope is called in English. And this is the constant term. It tells you where this line cuts the y-axis. Um, So this tells us two things already. So what I call tasks are maybe, uh, or objectives, it's to, well, it, it can tell us something about this uh, relationship, of course. So this number, for instance, so here it should be an x. Um, what does this number tell me? Well, actually, if this is. If you have some x here and you go to x plus 1, then what is this? It's the slope. It's b. So this number here, t 
tells me something very important in this uh, relationship. It tells me how much extra time do I need to take another kilometer of distance. So it's the marginal extra duration for, for an additional kilometer of distance. So you can call it the, uh, it has something to do with the average speed that you can do in this area or something. Um, yeah. So this tells us something about the relation. And in addition, we can use this uh, specific estimated model to make what we call forecasts or predictions for particular trips. So it's very easy if I say x is 10 kilometers, how much time would I expect to need for one single trip of this distance? So it's just to go into this picture, say here is x equal 10, and read what I find here. It's the same as just inserting 10 into this equation. So this gives y equal to 23.46 to be specific. So that's my guess. That's my uh, probably average duration for a 10 kilometer trips. But I will also like to ask some other questions how precise or how, how reliable is this for a single trip? So what's the variability here? I know this is the average, but I don't know whether the actual duration could be 30 or even 35. Uh, or with what probabilities could it be above 35? This is the kind of things that you would really need in planning under uncertainty. So instead of being very optimistic and plan that every trip is going on the, on the average duration, you would probably add a little slack to that and plan that it might take 25 minutes or so on. But using regression analysis, we can, we can uh, come a, a bit further in the planning here. So, and these questions like, uh, these deviations away from the mean here, they are clearly related to this thing. Uh. I think it's this guy, this machine just thinks I'm ready when I'm not moving this too often. Um. Yeah. See if it comes back to business. seem to be well there is some light in there oh, oh it's coming up again so 
So you can look at this picture, then uh, we got the SPSS to estimate this, uh, this regression function for us, this line. And you can also use, of course, the SPSS to draw this line into the scatter plot. You probably all did this sometime. So just to agree, where do we find our 23.46 for the 10 kilometer trips on, on this figure? Well, here is the distance. So you just look at here is 10. And the line inside of all these dots, it crosses in here. And if we have more details, we would find something like 23.46 in there. So it's this line here. And the y value corresponding to 10 is this value. And the variability for single trip randomness is very clearly shown here. So you can already guess that if we take something like uh, say y mean plus minus 5 just to shoot from the hip. So 5 is this much. And if I go 5 up or five down from the mean line, I seem to cover almost all the data points, right? So my first naive guess at the margin of error is something like this, just visually inspecting the thing, just to make you realize what is a margin of error. So most single trips will be probably within this, this interval here. Right. So up to this point, we've been kind of very descriptive. Let's now be a little bit more technical. building this step by step. OK. So we're going to use, whenever we f um, find sort of a scatter plot which seems to facilitate this linear dependency, we will use this model like this here. So I'm now going to call the parameters here beta 0 and beta 1. Um, and we call them a regression coefficients, typically. Some more uh, terminology. We typically call this y the dependent variable. Because this is, I mean, we say that y is dependent on x when we write it like this. And then y is the dependent, and x is called an independent variable. You will also see sometimes the word uh, predictor variable used for x, which means x is, uh, is x can be used for forecasting or predicting y. So we can use the distance in this example to predict the um, duration. And in that sense, we say that x is a predictor for, for y. All right. So as I said, we look at this random term here. And if our linear model is correct, this error term should have expected value 0. So it should be equally likely to be above as below the, the line. And one very important additional parameter to this model is what we call sigma e. That's the standard deviation of this, this error term. Um, so you have three parameters, actually. We have beta 0, beta 1, which are the regression coefficients, and this uh, standard deviation of the error term. Uh, those are the three parameters in this model. Yeah. 
So I think it's probably more or less obvious, but uh, when we have a linear line like this, we have some observations here. Then for a given x value, this is the mean observation. And this is sort of representing one realization of this error term, right? So if I can, and here we have lots of different sizes of these error terms. And if I can figure out the standard deviation of that, I could say plus minus two standard deviations. We remember something about plus minus two standard deviations? Something like 95%. Um, interval. So in the end, we are actually going to take as our 95% um, margin of error in forecasting with regression, we're going to use plus minus two times uh, an estimate for this guy. Because this is a theoretical parameter, we don't have the value, but we can estimate it from data. So we're going to have plus minus two times SE something. Just to make you appreciate the, the importance of this parameter. Okay, so uh, let's see. It's just I'm just going to figure out where I'm going and where I am. Okay, so um, this is the theoretical model. It tells us something about the structure of how we think x and y depends. But we cannot use that for any good purposes unless we have estimates for the parameters. So we need to have data. It means we have to observe our x and y together. So we get a list of x and y observations together and then try somehow to crank out of this the most um, what you call the most likely values for these parameter est estimates so you will see sometimes in the literature that you will find that the model, not in this general form, but in, a, in a, what we call a data form, where each observation is indexed by a number i here. So this is just to emphasize that you have an x1, and then you have a y1. And these are sort of connected with an individual error term EI. So it doesn't mean anything other than the original model, actually. It just, just tries to emphasize the repeated observations with individual error terms. So it's OK here to make a distinction, a clear distinction between the what we call the theoretical model and the estimated model. So this is the theoretical model. It has some parameters. And it's just a representation of our assumption that these two are depending linearly on each other. So it's about the structure of dependency, if you want to use some fancy words. 
but you need to realize that the parameter values in the sort of true model here, they will always remain unknown. So what we can do is just to take our data, a set of n observations, and try to estimate the best linear fit to that. So this happens. Uh, this data more or less always looks something like this. And then by it's often quite you you can come quite close just by visually drawing a line that you would guess be the best linear fit here, so something like this maybe. So it includes uh, two parameter estimates, which I call B0 and B1, for the true uh, parameters beta 0 and beta 1. And as I outlined here, we can also use all of these um, since we observe the data, we can compute this line here. And then I can also compute all of this, which I call uh, residuals, actually. So I compute a lot of such deviations. And I will use the size of those in general to estimate the, the sigma e, the standard deviation parameter. So it's only this one that's going to be available to use. But clearly, if we want to do statistics, it's, we're going to do this important thing that we did in other settings with other parameters. We are going to have to address the question, like, for instance, if we estimate B1 equal to 2.23. So this is an estimate for beta 1, but could could we have? So the interesting question is, what does this estimate tells me, tell me about the true slope? Could it still be less than 2, even though my estimate is as high as 2.23? That's what statistics can tell us. Um, yeah, so it's, it's really no, it's not much value to just have these estimates unless we know something about their precision. So it's about this actually, precision. And we know that this question leads us into confidence intervals, for instance. So this is what we're going to do probably uh, maybe even by the end of the day. How do we actually compute confidence intervals for these guys based on the data set? That is more interesting in a way than just getting these estimates. OK, I'm just going to talk this guy into not turning off. So. <laughs> um, So it's time for a break soon. Yeah. Just a final, final statement there. What does it mean? Um, I said that the theoretical model must be close to correct. Otherwise, there's no point of estimating. So what I mean by that is, of course, if you have something like uh, something that is very nonlinear, for instance, to post your data looks like this, which they could do. And you try to fit a linear model to this. You would probably get something like this. And uh, SPSS would be very happy to do it for you. It wouldn't even complain. But you need to look at the scatter plot and say that this is not linear. There. 
So if I estimate with SPSS, I get this linear model and I try to make predictions, for instance. I'm going to put an x here. And I can compute this number. But you see that this is probably, it's, I mean, it's below all the data points in this area. So I'm going to undershoot the true value for sure with this model. And if I go out here, take an x value here, my line predicts this value. But all the data values in this area are below. So it does not work as a forecasting model because I'm fitting a linear function to something that is very nonlinear. And that is, I mean, it's obviously not going to give any good results. Right. So the projector said, take a break. So take 15 minutes, whatever, yeah.